Doom Annihilation is a film adaptation based off one of the best video games ever made. Wolfenstein 3D. Nah, I'm just kidding. It's Super Mario Brothers. Nah, I'm just kidding. It's Doom, son. And on the off chance that you're part of the incredibly small demographic of people who haven't played it, in which case you're dead to me, it's safe to say it's easily one of the most important video games ever made. <laughs> but not a game with exactly all that much of a rich developed storyline, at least with the 1993 version anyway. In 2005, we got our first film adaption starring Dwayne, toned down the social media post Johnson, and Carl Urban as essentially the Doom Guy, though we played a much better Doom Guy years later as Judge Dredd. Now, in 2019, hold on to your butts because we've got another film based off the game with Doom Annihilation that's just been released. Direct to Video 2, which automatically is going to tell you all you need to know. Now, I've watched the film three times, and although I'm not a drunk Irishman who's funny because he's drunk and Irish, I still think that makes me an expert on the film and creates a legal obligation to review it. Well, not really, but let's do it anyway, shall we? Spoilers from this point in. This is cold shit. Right, so the opening of the film sticks pretty closely to the setup in the games. The Union Aerospace Corporation, or the USC for short, has a base on a moon of Mars named Phobos. What they're doing here is trying to open a portal between Phobos and Earth, and the project is led by a Dr. Petruga, named after the main antagonist from Doom 3. And it all seems like it's on the up and up, until after some truly horrible CGI effects, and we see some poor guy come out the other end of the portal looking all zombified. Cut to the main title, and now we're locked in. Next, we meet our protagonist, but instead of a Doom guy, this time we've got a Doom girl, played by Scottish actress Amy Manson. Her name in the film is Joan Dark, which I guess is supposed to be a reference to Joanna Dark from Perfect Dark, but who knows. And Joan wakes up from an upright sleeping pod in her underwear. Because if James Cameron's Aliens has taught us anything, it's that in the future it's a requirement that you sleep in your underwear when you go into stasis. Carrying on with that Aliens theme, what follows next is your typical get to know everyone scene. Where a bunch of people with no chemistry interact with each other for 5 minutes around a table. This is supposed to introduce every ancillary character at once, showing off the dynamic between each of them, a bit of their personalities, and maybe give us a bit of insight into what kind of people they are. Ironically too, in a scene that's just blatantly trying to tick some kind of diversity box, it somehow makes these characters even less interesting or memorable. And I couldn't even tell you most of their names if you held a rocket launcher to the side of my head. Yeah, and I gotta mention that Aussie guy Winslow, who's forcing that Aussie accent more than Aussie Man Reviews does. And that's forced. Let me tell you. Ah, shit. Anyway, after we don't really learn anything about any of these people, the real point of the scene comes to pass, and that's to set up the relationship between Joan and this Dr. Bennett character. We learn that Joan has been assigned to the Phobos base as a demotion, which again kind of mirrors the Doom guy being sent to Mars after attacking a superior officer in the original game. After this, we get a scene where we learn what the USC is trying to do, which is to harness these teleporters so they can travel from Earth to Phobos really quickly. Because yeah, people are going to be knocking each other over to hop into a teleporter that turns you into a zombie person with cigarette ash for skin. Next, we see a briefing with all the Marines, where Joan comes across as a complete psycho with a thousand yard stare. This is led by Captain Hector Savage. Wait, Hector Savage? Isn't that the bad guy from Naked Gun 2? Did they know that when they named this character? They also established that the Phobos base has a nuclear reactor as its power source, along with Bennett also emphasizing that the moon itself is incredibly unstable. Yeah, what a perfect place to put a nuclear reactor. It's like putting a cup of hot coffee on a tumble dryer. Back with Petruga, we see him taking one for the team and going through the teleporter himself, which is when shit finally kicks off. Then we see this girl walking up to the goddamn hell station from Doom 3. For a while though, look, I'm kind of alright with things, and the film then follows a little bit closely with the original plot from the game, where the Marines show up and find the entire Phobos base in disarray. Our mission is to enter the facility, ascertain the situation, get the base back online. It's also when old mate Winslow delivers his first zinger in the film. What the fuck is that? You then get a pretty cool sequence where everyone is arming up. The captain even has a goddamn super shotgun. You got your toy. I got mine. All the marines wear these helmets that look like they're more suited for rollerblading than combat, but in their visors there's another game reference. With all of them having what's basically an auto map in their heads up display. What happens next sets up the remainder of the film. The reserve powers are just over 2%, that gives us about 90 minutes. 
Basically, Dr. Bennett tells everyone that if they don't get the reactor back online, there's gonna be a core meltdown that's gonna rip the entire moon apart and then, you know, adios muchachos. Who the fuck designed this place? This is just one of the many scenes in the film that's reminiscent of a similar scene in Aliens. A lot like the scene when Bishop tells everyone that the power plant's cooling system is gonna explode and destroy everything. Look, all it really does is just put a sense of urgency on the main characters. It's basic screenwriting 101. This is what's referred to as an inciting incident. Almost right on point two at the 30 minute mark is when they find a dead body and some weird demonic writing on the walls. Yeah, and a dead guy with a blue keycard who happens to be named after BJ from Wolfenstein. Sergeant William Blaskovich. Soon after this, I guess the demons start possessing their comm system or something, and they run into a zombie that looks like a swollen ball sack. At this point, more zombies just come out of nowhere and start attacking people left and right. And we actually get what could be described as an action sequence. We even get two video game references for the price of one here. Fuck this, I'm too young to die! What happens next is my favorite bit in the entire film, where the token black guy says a line that makes no sense. I'm your ultimate nightmare, motherfuckers! Before getting killed off literally two seconds later. Shortly after this, Joan finds a chainsaw and 40 odd minutes into the film and we've got someone finally using one of the weapons from the video games. And I gotta say, it's not done horribly. It seems for a second like this scene is over, but no, 20 minutes into this whole sequence and these fucking zombies keep on coming, managing to kill off more of these supposedly highly trained marines. Oh, you ultra nightmare, motherfuckers! We finally get to see the captain put that super shotgun to good use, but it's all for nothing, as he's killed right afterwards anyway. No, no, no. Dr. Petruga then shows up, somehow still alive, and in a twist everyone saw coming, we find out the teleporters aren't man-made and probably created by aliens. Speaking of aliens, the next scene is another pretty blatant ripoff. In this bit, the alarmingly alcoholic pilot Morgan tries to power up the Marine's ship, but he turns around to see an imp right in his face that promptly kills him which is pretty much identical to how Pharaoh dies in Aliens. Now it seems like one of the screenwriters figured out that they hadn't done enough characterization or had enough exposition yet. So Betruga spends the next five minutes explaining everything. You turn them on and those things from who knows where came flying in. Honestly, I can't even be bored anymore because everything this guy says is just amazing. And he delivers the only line that matters in this scene anyway. We need to get the fuck out of here. When's yeah, you said it, bro. Again, they're back to ripping off scenes from Aliens. This time, it's mirroring the scene where Hicks and Ripley take charge and decide to destroy the Weyland yutani owned colony on LV-426, citing the fact that the military has jurisdiction over the operation. We all know the scene. This operation is under military jurisdiction and Hicks is next in chain of command. My right, Corporal? This is a military operation. What you will or will not allow is irrelevant. Back on the ship, they find Morgan's dead body and a bunch of imps show up and start wreaking havoc. One of them even throws a fireball, which is kind of neat, I guess. Actually, no, it's not. I take that back. All this means is our highly trained Marines again get their asses kicked. And old mate Winslow runs off in a dog act that shocks absolutely no one. Ah, nope. Like how this guy ever got enlisted is beyond me. You know, all I could think of during this scene was just how much better it would have been with the sound effects from the game. One of the imps then turns into a Dementor from Harry Potter or something, giving Joan some kind of weird nightmarish vision. Right about the same time another character we have no interest in is killed. With their ship Fubar, Betruga's got the brilliant idea of using the teleporters to get back to Earth. Despite evidence showing that's a catastrophically fucking bad idea. But Joan's super brilliant plan is to secretly send out another distress signal. So they go back inside and try to restore power and really at this point you're just waiting to see who's going to get killed next. Someone then remembered that Betruga is supposed to be the bad guy so in the next scene while they're all powering up the generator he just starts going through everyone's personal history. That's enough dog and tries to cause dissent amongst all of the characters by bringing up all this shit they said about each other in private. But then the power comes back on and everyone just forgets about it. Petruga then stabs his girlfriend and runs away, before more imps show up and start throwing Adobe After Effects fireball presets at everyone. I don't know what I liked more in this scene, the clearly rubber suits the actors playing the imps are wearing, or how nonchalantly they kill off the remaining side characters. And again, total missed opportunity here by not using the video game sound effects. With Betruga now gone and planning to open the teleporter, this is your standard third act twist. 
with the characters facing their final obstacle. And with only Joan and Bennett left, their only chance is to find the secret level of the facility, get it, secret level, so they can catch up to Petruga. Now, as much as I dislike a lot of stuff in the movie, I do like the introduction of the BFG in this next scene. Turns out the keycard they got off BJ is the same one that unlocks the room where the BFG is held. Nice touch. It's pretty badass, even if it does look like a nerf gun that's got a jar of piss for ammo. But chins up, we're going into the final act of the movie, with only two characters to focus on, meaning we might get a more sensible story. Plus, our main character is wielding a goddamn BFG. Like, what could go wrong? Oh, okay, well, maybe that? That didn't go to plan. But wait, Sonny Jim, she's gonna fire the BFG. Right, so did the person who wrote this script ever look up what a BFG actually does in the games? No. With few places left to run, Joan takes a trip down an elevator shaft from a PlayStation 2 CGI cinematic and finds the halls looking a lot like the Delta Labs from Doom 3. And again, I don't hate this because this is what we should have had from the beginning. Gore, blood, dead bodies. This is doom. And for a brief moment, my spirits are lifted. No. Joan finally finds Petruga, who I guess just stood there doing nothing this entire time. And Bennett shows up as a zombie, so she has to kill him. And you know, if we cared about this guy at this point, it might have had some impact. Then Petruga and his receding hairline manage to sneak up on Joan, but she disarms him like she disarms the patriarchy and shoots him dead, unceremoniously, without ceremony. <laughs> He's not dead though, and he shoves her into the portal. But at last, we finally made it. We're in hell, with only nine minutes remaining in the film. Yeah, they're wrapping this shit up in the next nine minutes. We've got places to be here, people. Bigger fish to fry. Gotta say though, this whole scene visually is pretty awesome. I mean, those designs for the imps are way better than the ones in the rubber suits. And the backgrounds and the overall aesthetic looks great. Even this big bad demon guy looks awesome, even if it's never explained what he is or what he's supposed to be. I mean, it's no spider mastermind or a cyber demon, but at least it's creative. Now, what I honestly think happened here is that they spent their whole CGI budget on this one scene, which explains why it looks so good and why it's the only time in the entire film when we see any of these creatures. This new demon is bigger and badder than the others and too strong for Joan to beat. But luckily, a forced sentimentality scene from the beginning of the film finally has purpose. And she somehow, like, remembers her faith or something. All it means is that it gives her the strength to get off her ass and grab the BFG and start killing everything, which she does. After a shot that's meant to mirror the poster from the original game, Joan jumps through the portal and finds herself back on Earth. She then does what any normal person would do and try to warn them about what's happened, but she's drugged by some asshole who just happened to have a sedative syringe on standby. Moments before something starts to come through the portal. And this is it, the final confrontation, the ultimate battle, Joan versus Betruga, good versus evil. Oh no, wait, that's the end of the film. Runtime, one hour 33. Yikes. I fucking knew it! Now look, it is easy to be a condescending asshole here, which is something I do very well, but truth be told, for a director video Doom movie, this is about as good as it's ever gonna get. Despite how lackluster a lot of the scenes can be, you still get the impression that everyone involved in this thing is trying their best. When Vitruga goes evil, the actor starts chewing the scenery so goddamn hard. And you kinda gotta love him for that. You can't kill what's already dead. So, the faults with this film aren't for lack of effort. The ultimate problem with the Doom movie is that it's based off a video game that never really needed to be turned into a film. It's a video game with an iconically mute protagonist, so right away when you turn it into a film and create a character with loads of dialogue, it's already going massively against the source material. Doesn't take a fucking genius to figure it out. If it was faithful to the game, it would just be two hours of one guy just running around and killing things over and over. And that's kind of boring. I do feel like they miscast the main character too. The blonde marine played by Nina Bergman would have made a much more believable badass than the one they went with. A lot of the other faults the film has comes more from the fact that it doesn't have a $100 million budget. It's a direct-to-video Doom movie shot on a shoestring budget, and that's exactly what it feels like, and you almost can't fault it for that. That's kind of why I don't think it's fair comparing this to the Doom movie from 2005, because they're on completely different levels, no pun intended. In a lot of ways, this is a better film too, because it's more accurate to the games, actually involving a portal to hell. Whereas in the 2005 film, the demons were instead mutations from the UAC experimenting on humans. The other thing is that it's sorely lacking a lot of Doom stuff. Here you've got such a huge potential list of creatures to throw in the movie. And all we get is some purple zombies and imps, neither of which look like their video game counterparts. 
the story doesn't really help things along either. The problem is that it just lacks focus. At the start, they're trying to introduce a dozen characters with all these marines, but they kill them off so fast that we never get a chance to get attached to them or even really know their names. If you're gonna go with the Joan Dark character, the setup should have been that it was just her and the Dr. Bennett character on the ship, both heading to the UAC base for reassignment. On their way to the base, the portal gets opened, all hell breaks loose, literally, and when the two of them arrive, they then have to figure out what happened. What you do is you have it so they know each other intimately, so there's a personal connection between them, and then you build upon that. You know what I mean? It's called character development. That's an understatement. If you have to have more Marines show up, have them already be stationed on the base to begin with, and Joan and Bennett meet up with them. I'm gonna shoot you in the face. You don't need a degree in screenwriting to see that there's just too many characters introduced here that we're supposed to be aware of and care about. What do you mean? Still, I do have to say that, amazingly, Doom Annihilation wasn't as awful as I thought it was going to be. Like I said before at the start of the review, this is about as good as a direct-to-video Doom movie is ever going to be. You can't really accuse it of being a cash grab, because clearly very little money was thrown into the production, and I think very little money is going to come out of it. Considering the filmmakers would have had to have known they'd be getting a largely negative backlash for releasing the film in the first place, we have to assume they instead continued making the film for the love of the source material, as amazing as that sounds. And I can't be mad about that. Doom Annihilation is the kind of movie that's perfect for watching with a couple of mates over beers and laughing at how hard they tried. You won't see a CGI Doom Slayer running around, double jumping over imps and revenants and dismembering demons with his bare hands you'll see a pissed off Scottish actress holding a BFG with one hand, using a jar of piss for ammo and punching an Australian jackass in the jaw in between shooting purple zombies. I deserve that. And you know what? The time spent watching this is less time waiting for Doom Eternal to come out. Oh, you ultra nightmare, motherfuckers! 